Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for welcoming me here to Podim. Okay. Too close to something. Um, who cares about culture? Okay, two people? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, today I'd like to talk to you about culture and why uh, that if you're not thinking about culture, you're not paying attention to culture, you're really not paying attention to your business. So, I think that every startup, every corporate here, everyone really in the room needs to understand about what culture means. And today I want to talk a little bit about what size versus speed means when it comes to culture. So, I just want to tell you a little bit about, my, about myself first. Uh, I am a husband and proud dad uh, to three boys uh, in Boston. And uh, I would like to challenge anybody else to, if they brought their 86-year-old mother to the conference, mom, stand up. <laughs> So I'm the youngest of five children, so you should talk to her about that later, because that's even more important. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an engineer by trade. I, I learned to program at a very young age, and uh, I started out on the, one of the very first computers and got to uh, really passionate about technology at a very, very young age. Um, I started five companies. I got bit by the entrepreneur bug very early. Uh, the companies that uh, I started have all been in really the technology space. Uh, I've raised uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from VCs like Kleiner Perkins, uh, Intel Capital, Northbridge, Bessemer, uh, and, uh, and a lot of, lot of angels. And I always knew that my career path was really to start companies uh, and, and work with young people and help them understand what it means to start companies and help avoid some of the pitfalls because there's a tremendous amount of potholes uh, that you can step in. Uh, my, my large corporate experience was with Apple, and I want to talk to you about Apple today because uh, it's very relevant to culture. Um, I did two things at Apple that I'm very, very proud of. One is I went to Apple uh, and I worked directly with Steve Jobs to help create the uh, Apple's education initiative called one-to-one -one laptop computing. And we worked to deploy laptops uh, statewide uh, entire, in, in across entire states, and uh, we work to train teachers and, and help uh, transform education. Steve Jobs' passion uh, at the very end of the day was around education and, uh, and what it meant for kids to use Apple technology. Uh, I built an enterprise division at Apple. Apple Enterprise is still very much an oxymoron. Uh, this word is, is uh, uh, people don't think Apple and enterprise in the same, la in the same sentence, and uh, it was something that um, that Steve Jobs wanted me to build, so I created an enterprise division at Apple, and as a part of that, I got to launch the iPhone in 2007 into the enterprise, which was an amazing experience. Uh, as, uh, as my badge reads, uh, I am a, uh, a mentor and investor, and uh, the reason why I'm here today is one of the companies I began mentoring and investing in five years ago was called Databox, and uh, Devoren uh, started his company in Patui. Uh, so uh, he wanted me to always come to Slovenia, and uh, coming to Slovenia was, uh, was, was something that I always promised him, so I'm here. Uh, so last thing before we get into it is I'm, I'm a culture vulture, uh, meaning that everybody in the room should be a culture vulture. Culture vultures go out and they experience the culture in and around their businesses, in and around music, art, technology, uh, and they bring those experiences back to their companies, and they make sure that the company experiences uh, rich culture from within. So I, I encourage you all to be passionate about, about culture. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this very simple. There are only three things you really need to take away from today's talk. Culture comes from the top down, okay? You have to understand as a management team, you have to create the right type of culture because it starts at the top and it flows down. Culture can bubble up from the bottom, but it starts from the top down. So make sure you and your management team talk about culture, talk about how you want to treat people, talk about how you want to hire people, talk about professional development, but culture comes from the top down. Second, people need a purpose. Everyone needs a purpose. 
There's been, there's been whole you know, uh, lectures, TV shows, movies around why people need to wake up in the morning and feel like today is something of importance for them, that they have a purpose. And each person in your company, you should, you should establish the, a purpose for them at the company. Okay, there's a lot of different things people can do. People wear different hats, but it, they have to have a purpose. They have to wake up in the morning and they have to feel like, like they're going to do something positive or something for the company each and every day. And then you've heard a lot, but the last is this open door policy. If you, if you, if you want to encourage people to communicate and collaborate, you have to have an open door policy. And that, that is literally an open door. You shouldn't, if you have offices, which I don't recommend as startups, uh, those doors should always be open. If you have closed doors, if you go back to your office today and you do have offices and those doors are closed, you have a problem. I can tell you right now, open the doors, collaborate, learn from each other, and always keep this policy. So, Steve Jobs, when I first worked at Apple, I first went to work at Apple, it was in the year 2000, and Apple stock was at $11, and the company was basically going into business. Uh, Steve just came back from, uh, uh, to the company in 1997. Uh, we borrowed $150 million from Microsoft to, to stay in business, uh, and that was, that was one of the things that, that Steve did, is look holistically at the company and the company culture. Apple was 16 different companies it was 16 different products, 16 different sales teams, 16 marketing teams, 16 engineering teams. The first thing he did was break down all the silos, okay? There was one team, one marketing team, one sales team, and groups of engineering teams, but they worked on all the products. There was a display team, there was an input team, there was an RF team, and so on and so forth. And now you don't have an iPhone team at Apple. You don't have an iPad team. You have an engineering group that works on the whole product line. That, is, that was critical to the company, it saved the company. And that was very much a cultural thing. <clears throat> Steve Jobs is, is famous for staying, saying these two lines, stay hungry and stay foolish. Steve Jobs doesn't want you to work for Apple for more than 10 years, okay? And actually he, before he died, one of the things that he told Tim Cook was, you know, everybody should be reviewed, and if you're there after 10 years, there better be a damn good reason for it, because he feels like everybody at Apple should go start their own companies, or should go do something else. You know, take a time in your career, be the most passionate you can be for those 10 years, but then get the hell out and go do something else with your life. It's true, right? And he wants you to stay hungry and stay foolish. That is part of the culture that Apple, that, that each employee at Apple is challenged to be. So, <clears throat> everybody needs a purpose, okay? Did anybody ever see the movie called The Jerk? All right, well, if you haven't, it's pretty funny, you should go see it. But this is Steve Martin, okay? And Steve Martin, this is when he was kicked out of his house, and he said, I don't need, I don't need you, I don't need, I don't need anything in this house. Well, I just, I need this chair, and, and then I need this thermos, I need this uh, racquetball. So, so he, from a cultural perspective, he didn't have a mission in life until he was told about his special purpose. So I'll challenge you to go watch the movie. You'll find out what Steve Martin's special, special purpose is. Create a mission statement for the company. Work towards realistic targets. Co-create job descriptions. Sit down with people and, and write out job descriptions. Don't do it for them. Don't hand people a description and say, do this. Get them to co-create it with you. Set out parameters and align the company's goals to each employee, and then align those goals, okay? If one of your employees wants to go out and, and take a course or go to a conference, if that's aligned to the company's goals, invest in them. You invest in them and you, you, you make that, that connection and then they're there, okay? They're there mentally, not just physically. IPDPs are something that you should look at. These are individual plans and everybody should have them. They don't have to be uh, you know, uh, line by line, but they have to be global. They have to understand where you're going in the company, how you wanna create your own career path. How, who, who, who do you want mentoring you at that company? <clears throat> and then 
Lastly, recognize success. Companies don't do this enough, but you have to recognize success. You have to invest in people. You have to recognize their successes. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Can I go back one? There we go. Open door. Communication is life and death. Okay, if you're not talking to people, they stop talking to you and it all goes downhill, especially in startups. If you can't invest in, in talking to people and opening that door, you, you're going you're gonna to have problems. Great managers and great directors, great leaders, they create environments for people to succeed. That's the number one mark of a manager. If you look at your managers in your company, if it's a startup or if it's a large corporation, Look at each one of your managers, or if you're a startup, look at yourselves as founders, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. And what, what you do is you create that environment for people to succeed. You give them challenges, you invest in them, and, and they start working, and, it, and it, it's, it's the success factor. Uh, managers, a lot of times, as the companies grow, managers stop feeling like they can solve problems, and that's a tragedy. Make sure that at every level of the company, as your startup grows, make sure your managers are completely empowered to solve problems. And what, what does that mean? That means that you create an opportunity to give them the ability to solve real-time problems, whether it's for a customer, if someone calls in <clears throat> and has a customer sat issue, empower people to give a discount, empower people to, to find out what customers need, but make sure that you don't set up roadblocks for your managers so that they can't solve problems. And then again, be accessible for your team and your customers and keep your startup as flat as possible. A lot of times when startups take money right away, they, they think that they have to create a hierarchy and that's a lot of times the death of your startup. So keep your startup flat. Don't put in a layer of management when there doesn't need to be a layer of management. This is really important. Okay, so a little bit on size versus speed. So startups, if you can't innovate faster, if you're not in the business to innovate faster than these big corporates that you're trying to work with or sell to, then you're in the wrong business, all right? So speed is critical, okay? It's critical to understand, to create a roadmap that has realistic dates, but those roadmap dates and as you deliver your product, and as you think about how long it takes to build your, your platform or your service, it has to be beating the market. And, and, and if you don't know if it's beating the market or not, then you have bigger problems, okay? But you have to be faster. Size is the winner for startups. You have to innovate, and you have to do that faster than corporates. Culture drives speed, <clears throat> okay? When you think about how long it takes to uh, hire a team, or how long it takes to create a product roadmap, or feature functions, okay, you need to make sure that it's culturally, it's culturally balanced. You don't want to work people to death, you want to have fun, okay, and you want to create challenges for people, but you need to make sure people are working at a pace that outpaces the market. So again, you know, if you've, if you've got a team that's working too slowly, all right, and not making deliverables, you have to have that challenge, you have to have that managerial courage to step in and, and make sure that you're working faster. Because <clears throat> speed is the key. That being said, you can never sacrifice quality for speed. If you're not able to make deliverables and there's quality issues, all right, then maybe you have the wrong people, you're using the wrong technology. Uh, something's wrong, but you need to get in there and you need to get in quickly because <clears throat> if you have quality issues with the product, you need to stop before you continue, and that's critical. If people, if, you're, if your engineers, if your managers think they're working on uh, crappy technology or stuff that doesn't work, or if you're pushing builds out to the market too quickly and you're having issues, that's the worst way to operate and the best way to ruin the culture of your company. People will leave because if, qual if they sense quality is an issue, you're, you're in big, big trouble. <clears throat> Stay close to your customers again. This is just listen to the customers. When you, when you are a startup, the best thing you can do is invite customers to your company meetings. 
okay? The voice of the customer is more powerful than anything you can say as a founder, as a CEO, anything. Once you, the magic of creating a communication and dialogue between a customer and an engineer or a product manager, okay? Don't be afraid to put these people together. I mean, you know, engineers are kind of wacky people. You know, you know them just as well as I do. But don't, don't try to shield them from that voice of the customer. It's magic when customers start talking to your team. I highly recommend doing it. If you have no customers, go get a customer and then have them talk to your team. And you have to be smarter with money. Big companies blow big money, okay? Budgets for something that take multi-millions of dollars that you can do for tens of thousands of dollars, okay? That is the, that's the key formula for you to succeed as a startup. Use money wisely, okay? Just because you raised $2 million, $10 million, that doesn't mean you have to spend that money on, on preconceived notions of, of where that money gets spent. Constantly ask yourself as a management team, why are we spending this money? Where can we spend this money differently? How can we maximize money? That is the key. You have to be smarter with it. So in summary, if you're building a company, <clears throat> build the house you want to live in. Okay, so think about that for a second. If you're building a company to flip it, all right, and you really don't care about the culture, the people, the customers, you're, you, you, ha you have to ask yourself why you're doing it. You know? And because at the end of the day, if you don't want to work for the company that you start or you found, then, then there's, a, there's a bigger issue. It happens all the time. Founders get disenchanted, they get frustrated. There may be problems with a team member, a co-founder, an engineer, okay? But meet problems head on and build the house you want to live in, okay? Build a company that you think is going to last. Don't, don't, be, don't, don't be forced to feel like you need to sell the company, okay? That's a big cultural issue. At, <clears throat> challenge people to hit your goals, all right? And constantly create a cadence for talking about goals and achieving goals. And again, celebrate big wins, or celebrate wins, <laughs> big and small, um, because take time to have those parties, okay? I'd rather spend money on a party and, and, and getting people talking to each other, drinking beers and, and, and having some fun uh, versus, you know, a, a marketing presentation or, or an outsourced marketing pitch. So th this is really, really important. Celebrate wins, big and small. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we, were we do have a couple of questions here. Um, let's see, we had those already. Let's see. Yeah, here, yeah. regarding speed versus size, when is the time to establish well-defined processes and startups? What is the influence on culture then? What is the time to establish well-defined pro... Oh, okay. Uh, so that's a very good question. Uh, processes get defined as people uh, take on the responsibility that are critical to the company. Um, a great example of this is uh, I just worked with a company that opted for ISO certification. Uh, ISO stands for International Standards uh, Organization, and it is extremely <laughs> burdensome to create uh, and to get ISO certified. ISO is usually in the manufacturing process, but that those processes are line by line, step by step, and they define, they even have processes to define a process. Now, if you are in a regulated industry, <clears throat> sometimes you need that. If you're in a startup, you need to, the time to create processes is when people need to have responsibilities and start stepping up and reporting uh, on those processes and those deliverables. So I would say from day one, when you bring someone in, define process at a high level, Give them the opportunity to co-create the process, especially if they're good. You know, Steve Jobs always used to tell us, hire people who are smarter than you are, okay, who, who are more experienced than you are. And, you know, 
when you hire people, ask them what they think about the process and then define it. But I would do it very early. Thank you. Um, I keep some moving. I'll switch to this. In your view, what is the winning corporate culture and how to formulate it? A winning corporate culture. A winning corporate culture. So a winning corporate culture is a culture where everybody feels like they can contribute to, to winning and to uh, having fun. So winning and having fun, to me, are, that's, that's kind of the magic uh, uh, and, and feeling like you're, 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 you have a purpose, right? Like you're feeling like you're solving a problem or delivering something of value. Once you, once you can create that recipe of fun, uh, collaboration, and, uh, and a sense of purpose, then you have an amazing recipe to build a company with. Thank you. Um, and maybe one more. This is an interesting one. Must a culture need to be built from the top down, or can it also reach its way bottom up? Okay, so <clears throat> again, the, your management team and the founders for startups in this case, you set the culture, you set the cadence, how you want people to behave and treat each other, what the mission of the company is, why it's important, and why you're there. However, <clears throat> bottom-up culture happens when people have great ideas, when they spot something that's not quite right, and they, have, and they feel like they're empowered to open their mouth and to change. And that's, that's, that's when you can take bottom up and great ideas that bubble up from the bottom. <clears throat> but the only way you do that is through that collaborative co-creation, open door policy, and then you get amazing ideas that come up from the bottom. You combine them with that top down and you get everybody talking and, and succeeding. Out of personal interest, no offense here, very often when I kind of work with large corporations myself, I have the feeling that bottom up works top-down works, but in between the middle, specifically the middle management, seems to be the ones who are kind of slowing everything down. How do you incorporate them into this whole process? So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a great uh, TV commercial, and it, it has your sons and daughters, and, you know, it zooms in on the daughter, and she tells her father, she said, Dad, I aspire to be a middle manager. <laughs> okay, and so, <laughs> so... There's nothing wrong with middle managers. The problem with middle managers is that they, they lack the ability to affect change. And they're not given the ability to, uh, uh, whether it's money, people, resources, to really uh, create and be listened to and create the type of change. So <clears throat> the, with big companies, what we always did at Apple is we reviewed every, every stack, every team, and who the middle managers were. And, and most of the times, we made sure the middle managers were the people that led these, these meetings and led the, the, uh, uh, the new ideas. So even if those ideas came from uh, you know, the bottom or the top, it was the middle that was articulating them. And we usually had a lot of luck with that. So you empowered them, so to speak. What's that? So you empowered the middle management, so to Empo speak. Exactly. You have to empower the middle managers, or else they will become blockers and the no team. And that will stunt your any uh, hope to really grow the company and to accelerate past your competitors. There was a question that kept kind of popping up and down the whole time, so I'll, I, I will ask it. And it was, do you consider yourself as hungry and foolish? Um, yes, I'm a middle manager. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I do, I do, and, and being hungry and foolish to me means being curious and, and asking questions. So many people, they just don't ask questions, you know? It's amazing to me. Like, I love when my three boys ask questions of adults. I love when my mom comes, you know, 3,000 miles away, and she asks, starts asking questions, just because that's the only way that people open up, and you give people the opportunity to share and to collaborate with you. So you have to be hungry, and you have to be foolish. Being foolish means being curious and, uh, and opening yourself up to not always knowing the answer. And if you can do that, some wonderful things happen in your life, and I hope each one of you will do that. Beautifully said, and I have one last question for you. Is there anything specific you're kind of looking out for yourself right now? Something where you say, hmm, that will keep me, get me really excited? Anything specific? Yeah, I mean, while we're, while we're talking at a technology conference, 
I, I love uh, these, these transformative technologies. Uh, my team and I are spending a lot of time uh, looking at AI, uh, looking at um, voice specifically. We think voice is gonna change everything. Uh, you know, it used to be the keyboard. It used to, now then it went to the mouse. And now voice, you know, starting with Siri on a mobile device and then Alexa in home, you're going to see voice change everything. And I would encourage you, each of you who are product managers or founders or work in big companies, to look at voice and look at how to use voice to, to transform uh, experiences with customers and with your employees. It's very, very exciting. So that's where we want to be. Thank you very much, Chuck. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks a million. Right, take, take care, care guys. Cheers. Cheers.